Welcome back, everybody. Monday morning briefing, episode number 61. It's January the 11th, 2022. Here's our box from last week we talked about. I was doing inventory, getting all our tax stuff kind of done ahead of time, getting it done early this year for once. And so we've gotten all of our inventory done in the shop. We counted everything, all the retail stuff, raw material, hardware, all the different little categories. We got everything counted, got everything totaled up. And then we've gotten all of our files from last year, any kind of paperwork, you know, invoices, receipts, uh, meal receipts, uh, bills, anything that anything that we had in the office that had the date of 2021 on it is now organized in this box in different manila envelopes between uh, personal, you know, farm expenses, shop expenses, different things like that. Got it all organized in this box. We've still got a little bit of paperwork that we've got to get. Um, usually this time of year, you're waiting on W-2s, 1099s, any of that kind of stuff. All of that stuff will go into a file. I've got the file over there on my bench. I just start a new file every year and I write down, I've got a checklist of things that I've got to gather up for my CPA. Once that file is complete, then that gets sent to the CPA. Everything that's in here should technically already be in our accounting software, which we use QuickBooks. So it'll be inside there. He can pull that file and then we can begin in any questions he has or anything else he needs. But if he needs something, it's probably going to be in this box. Once he's done and we've got the file done and our tax return done, this box will get taped up, get 2021 wrote on the side of it, and it'll get filed away in a closet. And hopefully we'll never have to look at it again. And that'll be good. So it's a good thing to do that in January like we talked about last week. If you haven't started your tax stuff, you're not even wanting to think about that, you want to just dive right back into leather work and get going, I'd highly advise at some point this month, get your inventory done, get all your stuff uh, filed away, just stay organized. It'll start your year off a lot better and you don't have to worry about it. I'm already feeling better that I'm not gonna have to worry so much about my taxes come April, except for paying for them, but I won't have to worry about gathering stuff because I've already done all that work. So it killed a one week beginning of the year, but I'm glad that it's out of the way, it's done, we don't have to worry about it. So now we're gonna move on. In doing inventory, I've been kind of, you know, as you do inventory, it's a great deal to do, um, even if you didn't have to do it for taxes, just so you can keep an eye on what you have, what you're running low on, what you need to order more of, what you don't need to order ever again because you've still got the same amount you started with last year. You can look at all of that stuff and really get a handle on what you're keeping in your shop because you gotta remember, a uh, drawer full of buckles or a shelf full of leather, that's cash. That's your cash money sitting on the shelf. And if it's not moving, you're not turning it over fast enough, then you're tying your money up for no, no reason. So that's what we're doing um, this week so far. Like yesterday, I got in the cut room. We cut up some stuff to fill orders because we're, we're running pretty low on uh, some of the material packs. If you, as you've seen on the website, probably we're out of a bunch of stuff. We do have another leather shipment coming at the end of the month. So I need to make room in the cut room and at least organize it and sift it out so that when the new stuff comes in, we can still continue to work on the scrap. You need to always be focused on your scrap leather before you pull a new hide out and cut something out of it. If you can get it from scrap, that's where you'll really start increasing those profit margins and really dialing that in and not wasting as much um, leather and as much time and money um, than cutting into a brand new hide. When you cut into a brand new hide, that's a very expensive event. And so if you can get it out of your scrap pile and, uh, and by scrap, that definition of scrap does not mean that it's trash. It just means that it's pieces. It's not one whole hide. So the guy I was learning to build saddles from, we'd always have people come in wanting scrap leather for making a knife sheath or just piddling around or doing whatever. And he always told them there is no scrap in a saddle shop. We use everything. But yes, I will sell you a piece of leather, um, a, a small piece. And that was just his way of portraying that like none of this is trash, it still has value. And so your scrap still has value. You gotta keep an eye on that and just kind of monitor that. Um, I visited with a man that had a manufacturing company in the leather industry for, you know, they, they were a very old company and he'd worked in the industry probably 30, 40 years. And he was a number cruncher and really spent a lot of time diving into the numbers. And uh, because in a manufacturing plant, their profit margins usually are a lot smaller. So they really have to have their hard work costs, their leather costs, their yield, all that stuff needs to be really, really dialed in because they're working off a of very small profit margins. And um, and so I trusted his numbers, you know, as far as anything that he would kind of advise me on or anything. And one of the things that he said was that after they, even in the manufacturing plant, after they cut every single square inch of that hide they could and turn it into a product that they could market, even after they did that, they were still throwing away somewhere around 30%, 28 to 30% in the trash. Um, 
And that's kind of sad to think if you buy a $200 piece of leather, you got 30% of that money going back into the trash can. That's that's not a good place. It's not something that uh, any other material, I think, has that bad of a yield. But leather is that way because it's a natural product. So not every square inch of that thing can you use depending on the projects. But the goal is to really go through those scrap bins and try to find some type of product you can create with every bit of that scrap if you can. Um, you're probably still going to have to throw some away, especially if you're in this deal for any length of time. The scraps will begin to pile up, and then you've got storage issues where you're going to put this stuff. You're tripping over it. You know, it's it's getting in the way. At some point, you do have to throw some away, and it will go bad. The, the older leather gets in a box, um, especially in, in like, a, say, a garage or, or an outdoor shop where it's maybe not as climate controlled, that leather... Uh, the attributes of that leather will change some and it'll get drier and harder and it, it's just a, it, it gets to where it's really not going to work anymore so it can it can go bad but it takes a lot a long time but if you've got boxes of scrap leather that have been in your shop for four or five years if you haven't opened them in that that length of time you probably just need to chunk it because you're not going to do anything with it and um and it'll break your heart to throw any kind of leather away but it's one of those deals where if you you're better off trying to find some type of project even a just a little project even if you can turn that you know, 50 cent piece of scrap into $3 uh, fairly easily, that's better than just chunking it in the trash. So we try to do that here. We try to try to use as much of the scrap leather as possible. When it comes to chap leathers, uh, especially exotics, um, any kind of harness leather, latigo, that kind of stuff, I very rarely throw any of that away because that stuff is shelf stable, so to speak. Your veg tan leathers, um, their veg tan leathers like over there, those are the ones that'll kind of go bad over time. They, they'll color differently if they're really old and that kind of thing. So we try to work through those scrap bins the most and uh, the most often. And so that's what we're doing here. I've got a lot of necks and bellies and just big chunks and pieces. Uh, we kind of keep it sifted throughout the year as we're cutting and doing things. But I always like to really, really work up my scrap pile in the cut room um, a couple of weeks before I get my next shipment. And that way I can make enough room. And that way, when the new stuff comes in, I'm not pulling out a brand new hide to cut something small out of. We've, we've gone through all the small pieces and cut all we could out of that and put those in boxes so that we have them. So that's what we've been doing. Um, I worked on that some yesterday. We got this wrapped up last week. I wasn't in the shop all weekend. Um, we had to do some stuff at the house to try to get ready for winter. Um, being in Texas, especially South Texas, we're just now starting to get some cold weather. And uh, we had we've already had one little freeze and stuff. And so... We're hoping we don't have a situation like we did last February, uh, where we have the, uh, you know, the, the bad, bad freeze and ice and all that kind of stuff. But if we do, we're trying to be more prepared than we were last year. Um, and so we went and got some heaters and uh, for the well houses and stuff, and um, ended up, you know, wrapping pipes and, and being sure everything was buttoned down and ready to go for winter time, uh, just in case we do get that bad freeze. So far, so good. It's been, you know, at night maybe the high 30s, low 40s during nighttime and then during the day it's getting some days are 50 some are 60 so we can handle that kind of weather um, i know we'll probably get some pretty good freezes between now and easter we always do and um, and like i said hopefully not anything like we had in february but hopefully we're prepared best we can also had a local guy that has done some work for me on a few other things he came by and actually fixed our ridge cap on the back building there where we had the snow last year come through because it blew in underneath the ridge cap on our roof um, and left that line of snow down the middle of the shop. We've also had a problem throughout the year of just rain. If we get a really bad rainstorm and it's blowing, it'll blow up underneath there and get some water inside the shop, a uh, little bit of leak. And so we've got to be real careful where we set hides of leather and things like that. But he came through yesterday and actually sealed all that up with some foam inserts that go inside there. And uh, they knocked it out. I didn't even know they were there. He told me they were coming. And um, I think when I left, I finally I looked up there and they had already done the work. So um, they were very efficient, hopped in and got it out. So we're tr trying to get a few things done here at the shop just to button some things up. Uh, a few little projects here and there that we've been wanting to, uh, to get done and stuff like that. But I'm having other people do it. That's something that I, I could do, but I don't have time. We've got things to do in the shop. We've got videos to make. We've got saddles to build and things to do. So we're trying to stay focused this year more on what I do and let other people that do what they do, do, um, do their part and uh, just pay them and, and go from there. And so that way kind of frees us up. We've got, like I said, we've got a lot of plans this year, especially this first quarter. We've got a lot, of, a lot of irons in the fire right now, a lot of things going on. And so I'm just trying to spend as much time as I can in the shop during the week. And then that way too, I can spend some time at home 
taking care of things that need to be done out there. If you're following us on Instagram, speaking of at home, you did see that we had a, uh, a new addition to the family. Uh, there we had uh, my little kid's show heifer that we've been showing for the last couple of years now. She had her first calf and uh, it was a little bull calf and we were hoping for a heifer, but it's a little bull calf. It's here, it's healthy, everything's good. And so we're really excited uh, that that happened. We've been kind of checking on her. She was getting close to due date. So we were kind of getting up at night and checking just to make sure, uh, just want to make sure everything went fine and she had it okay. Um, she's up in the barn, obviously. And up until yesterday, nothing had really happened. You know, nothing, she seemed content. Everything was good. And we all left for work and school yesterday morning. And uh, Claudia came by here and did some stuff and then was headed back out to feed uh, first thing in the morning. And when she got back out there, the calf was here. Uh, they were both up, moving around, looking good. And so it happened probably right after we left for school and work. So, but I was glad everything went well. I'm glad she didn't have any trouble. So, so now she has a calf at her side and we're going to show, I think she ages out in four or five months in the show series that we're in. And so we're going to get a few more months of showing her. We've got a show at the end of the month. We'll take her to, um, and uh, she'll show with a calf at her side. So that'll be kind of fun, interesting to experience that. And so we're going to do that. And then after that, she'll be done. She'll be retired from showing and, um, she might get kicked out with the other cows, which she might not like because she spent all her life in the nice cozy barn. So we'll see how all that goes. She's pretty spoiled rotten, so she might end up staying in the barn a little longer. But real quick, we've got, like I said, we're going to get back to work here in the shop. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, got a lot of stuff coming coming your way that we'll, like I said, send out a newsletter about and uh, talk about and as, as things kind of get finished up and finalized. But one thing I wanted to talk about real quick was uh, different types of palettes. If you're doing a lot of painting, um, I've tried all kinds of stuff and honestly, a uh, paper plate works great because when you're done, you can just chunk it, uh, and, and it works fine. I, lately, the last, I guess, three or four years, I've been using these little plastic pallets. I got these at Hobby Lobby, um, and they're just a, a thin plastic. It's got little wells in it, so you can put, drop your different colors in each different well, um, and they clean up fairly well. I know this one still looks kind of dirty, but as long as there's not globs of paint, but my kids get over there and they'll paint stuff and work on stuff. And this thing occasionally will have, you know, a quarter inch of paint layers all over this thing. The nice thing is if you'll set this in your sink and just let hot water run on it for say, you know, five minutes or so, then you can come back in and with an awl or, or even just a you know butter knife or something, you can peel all that paint right off on the acrylic paints. It'll peel right off and, and stay fairly clean and you can just reuse it. They're also cheap enough if you wanted to, I guess you could throw them away, but they only come one to a pack and I can't remember what they are. I got these at Hobby Lobby. The next, my next favorite one is this one. I got at Hobby Lobby as well. It's a lot heavier plastic. This one's real thin. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's kind of almost throwaway, but I clean it cause I'm, cheapskate and so i clean them and reuse them but this one here has been really really good it's real flat there are no wells or anything but i usually just drop a few colors that i need when i'm mixing or painting and again this one cleans up really well um, you could probably take a little acetone and really get it back to bright white but i just try to get the globs of paint off so they're not in my way when i'm when i'm painting but a lot of times this thing will stay you know with some dried paint on it and stuff like that for a few weeks before i'll finally get frustrated and clean take the time to clean it off but again, with acrylic paint, it's a water-based paint. So just a uh, hot water running in your sink, let that run on this thing for a little while. And that paint really just pops right off, peels off really easily. And so this one's probably my favorite just because I don't have a limited you know, well access. I can just kind of put paint wherever I need to, mix it wherever I need to, and kind of go from there. On this one here, um, I don't really mix down in these wells. I usually end up mixing here on the high spots and it's really not enough room or mix right here in the middle, but that's a real small area. So this one is probably my favorite, but again, you could get by with just a paper plate. Um, I use those for years in the shop and you know, just then when you're done with your that project or whatever, you can, if you have big globs of single colors, you can take a palette knife and pick those colors up and put them back in the bottle that they came out of. Um, but if you just got a bunch of mixed shades of different stuff and just chunk that in the trash, um, paint's cheap enough. You don't have to really, really worry too much about that. Um, and then Claudia for Christmas bought me a couple uh, just to try out. You know, it's just more of a stocking stuffer kind of thing. She got me one of these, and it's actually got a little thing here to hold uh, some brushes, maybe or something. I think probably be handy. Just put water in that, and then you've got these little wells here. Um, this one is interesting. I may just give this one to the kids. I'm just me right now. Just I haven't used it at all, but just looking at it, I'm like, I don't know if that's going to be really my speed or not. 
Um, but then she did get me this one, which I really like, and it's ceramic. And so I'm sure if I drop it, it's going to break. And so that probably will happen at some point in this shop, either from me or my son. We'll drop it on the floor and bust it into a few pieces. But until then, I'm going to give it a shot. But I really like it. It's got these little wells, too. I'm sure it'll clean off fairly well. So that's kind of interesting there. You might want to give one of those a try. But like I said, pallets, when it comes to pallets for paints, you can use really anything. Um, like I said, paper plate was something that we used for years. Um, the, the deal with paint whenever, and I tell my kids, kids this all the time, but they, they're kids, so they don't listen. When you're painting something, you would be surprised how little color you need to do an entire belt or do an entire wallet or whatever you're painting. You don't need, you know, a quarter size glob of paint on your palette. All you really need is a few drops, uh, you know, just maybe, maybe a half a dime size, maybe not even that much. Um, because that color will go a long way, especially if you're thinning it down with water like we've talked about in a few of the painting videos. Or if you're using the uh, Alpha 6 paints from Makers, those paints, I really like the bottles particularly that those paints come in because they're, they got a flip cap on them and you can just squeeze out just one drop or two drops, you know, and it's, it's kind of measured. With the Angelus, you pull the top off and you go to pour and some of those come to you a lot thinner than the other ones. Some of them are thicker, some of them are thinner. And so when you go to pour, sometimes you pour a whole mess out on the pallet and then you've got to take a pallet knife and try to pick the bulk of that up and put it back in the bottle and that kind of thing. So I prefer the little squeeze, the squeeze uh, flip caps like they have on, on the Alpha 6 paints. Um, but yeah, if you're thinning them down with either the reducer that Alpha 6 uses or, or even water, then you, you don't really need a lot of color. A little bit goes a, a long way. And so try to reduce how much you're putting on your palette and that'll kind of save your paint um, over time. You won't waste as much. But like I said, I've bought dang near every color Angelus made probably 10 years ago, and I still have plenty. I've replaced some colors, but I don't I don't buy paint very often just because, you know, you buy a four-ounce bottle of paint, that'll last you a pretty good while um, unless you're just, you know, I guess if you're painting big scenes or something or using, you know, a ton of paint if you do a lot of paint work. But for general saddle stuff and adding a little color to belts and wallets, um, you're not going to need a lot of paint, so don't don't go out and spend a thousand dollars on paints thinking you're going to need every color and all that. And like we've talked about before, do a little research on color theory. Uh, there's some great videos on YouTube on mixing color, and um, and you can honestly get quite a few colors out of just the uh, limited palette, you know, with just your primary colors and stuff like that. But some of your brighter, you know, turquoise and neon colors and stuff like that, you'll have to buy those. But you don't need every shade of brown, and you don't need every shade of gray. You just need, you know, one or two of those, and then you can mix and, and bring them up or down and tone however you want to do that. But that's palettes. Like I said, I, I you can use whatever you want. These are just a few that I've used. Um, and like I said, this big one here, this is my favorite one. This one this one will, will be a keeper. This one I use quite a bit in the shop. It's my go-to on the, on the bench there just because I can clean it. And uh, I hate running out of paper towels and paper plates in the shop, that kind of thing. So... That's just one less thing I've got to replace. I just got to clean it. And I let it go for quite a while sometimes, and then I've got to finally break down and go clean it out because it's driving me crazy. But that's really all I got for you this week. I'm going to get back in the cut room today. We've got to fill some uh, some of our bins over there for the material packs and stuff with some of the scrap that I have. I also got a bunch more goat skin, so we will be refilling the bifold material packs on the website. So if you've been wanting some bifold uh, material pack, I think we're out of everything except black right at the moment. But don't worry, I've got all the colors. Uh, we bought a big shipment uh, right before Christmas, so I do have some. I just haven't cut it. So we'll try to cut that today or tomorrow and get those back on the website so they're refilled and as far as the cut bench page you may keep an eye on that because there's no telling what may end up on there from this uh, cut session this week when i go through these scraps i may even throw a few of those rifle sling uh, pieces on there uh, just to try out those dies because i think i've got some some pieces of leather back there that are thin and are long enough that i can cut a few of those rifle slings out and give them a whirl um, and then we'll hopefully get that as a, a standard material pack on the website as we go along. Once that next leather shipment gets in, I'll see how many I can cut up. But we're going to go ahead and get after that. I appreciate you guys watching this week, and we'll see you next week in the Monday Morning Briefing.